Hi, this is Andrew, and this is Keynote, the daily now.tv chat show with some of the world's leading thinkers and writers. Hello, everybody. Not a day seems to go by without some article or new book or movie or op-ed about living longer, living healthier, our aging society. In America, we seem to be controlled by a political gerontocracy, although other people celebrate getting older. Um, my guest today is one of the world's leading experts on living longer. He's an economist, uh, Andrew J. Scott. He teaches at London Business School. He's the author of all sorts of interesting books. Uh, one on a hundred year life, uh, which some people might look forward to, some people might fear. Another book is entitled The New Long Life. Sounds like milk, but it's actually, uh, I guess it refers to us as human beings. And he has a new book out, The Longevity Imperative, Building a Better Society for Healthier, Longer Life. Lives. He is indeed Mr. Long Life, and he's joining us from London Business School in the heart of London. Um, Andrew, tell me about yourself. How old are you? Uh, I'm 58. Is uh, that old? I mean, in the old uh, days, that would have been old, wouldn't it? Yeah, a little bit. I mean, it, it, kind of one of the themes of the book is that we sort of got this aging thing a bit wrong. Uh, and that's chronological age. I'm 58. But there's two other concepts of age that are really important. How many more years you can expect to live? And at 58, I'm going to have to behave differently from my dad and my granddad at 58 because I have more years ahead and I've got to behave differently. And, of course, the other key thing is your biological age, just kind of how you're aging. And we need to sort of spend a bit more time thinking on those two measures of age rather than just how many candles you've got on the birthday cake. How much of this, Andrew, is bound up with social class? You're a, a fancy business school professor. You went, I think, to Oxford and the London School of Economics, and you taught at Harvard. You've traveled around the world. So you're very much part of the upper middle class, this new uh, technocratic intelligentsia. But you grew up where? In, uh, in Edmonton, in North London? Yeah, Edmonton and Enfield. So, uh, yeah. Were your, was your, you mentioned your father and your grandfather. Were they, and I use these words carefully in England, people take a, a more comfortable with them than Americans. Were they working class? Uh, yeah, complicated concept, but yeah, I certainly. Uh, I, uh, I guess you'd call me up with you mobile socially. So, yeah. Um, my, I think my dad left school at 14 and started working in, uh, as a post a male boy in a newspaper office and my uh, granddad uh, left school at 12 it was actually a pianist a traveling pianist bill fingers palmer i talk about him in the book actually and then uh, what were your father and grandfather like at 58 yeah that's an interesting question of course you know i, I kind of wish i could go back and ask them actually because of course as a, as a child you would just always think of the old people as being old um my dad had a heart attack at 60. He stopped work when he was 62. Uh, I didn't actually meet my dad's dad. He died before I was born. So, you know, one of the things I look at in the book is I sort of look at these big trends by trying to relate it to my own family. And what's interesting, you look at the time of the age of death of my family going back 200 years, uh, it's increased two or three years every decade. So that's bang on with the average tendency. Over the last 150 years, Life expectancy has increased two or three years each decade. So on average, each generation is living six to nine years longer than the previous, which is quite an extraordinary shift. So, so what, Andrew, why, why has this happened? Is it medicine? Is it lifestyle? Um, it's, a, it's a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, you went back to social inequality. I mean, aging is malleable. We kind of discovered that because we've got more people living for longer. Uh, if you, uh, about 80% of how you age, sort of below about 85 is due to uh, behavior in the environment. And over time, we've improved our behavior, and we've improved the environment, and we've benefited from better, better medical treatment. So the, the first big shift was reducing infant mortality. And the, the book starts with my birth. I, I was born in 1965, and I was an identical twin. And my twin sadly died within the first few days. And I kind of researching the book, I just looked up to see how common that was. And, I was pretty stunned to find out that uh, the most common age of death 
in the UK and the US in 1965 was children under one. I kind of thought that was just a Victorian thing. Now the most common age of death in the UK is 88. So, wow, in my lifetime, that's quite a shift. That's not the average, that's the most common. But we had big improvements in uh, nutritional intake and in terms of hygiene. We made birth much safer. We made kids safer in their early years. And that was the first big shift in life expectancy. Then more recently, we've been really successful in reducing uh, middle age disease and heart attacks. We're much better at treating heart attacks. Believe it or not, people in general are uh, drinking less, smoking less, uh, work is less dangerous. So that sort of really pushed life expectancy up. And now most of the life expectancy gains are coming from your chance now of living beyond 70 and hitting 80 and 90, which is kind of where the longevity imperative comes in. You know, in the US, uh, the Amer American Academy of Actuaries says that a child born today has a 50% chance of living into the early to mid 90s. It's the same in the UK. And that's a long life. And, you know, great, we're living a long life, but we worry about getting old. We worry about outliving our health, our wealth, our finances, our skills, our relationships, which I think leads to the longevity imperative. What are you going to do now to age well in the future? And the later you leave it, the harder it is to age better. Uh, and to say, ageing is malleable, there's plenty of things we can do. And our society is simply not structured to support us to live that long, because in the past only a few people made it into the 90s. When it's the majority, we've really got to do things differently. Andrew, you present this uh, progress, which I think most people would agree is inevitable and linear, but one of your fellow economists, actually a Nobel Prize winner, Angus Deaton, who's been on this show, teaches at Princeton, an Englishman originally, uh, has written famously about deaths of despair okay. uh, in the United States. The, 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 the picture is a bit more complicated if you compare the US with other countries, particularly, I'm guessing, Northern Europe and perhaps even the UK. How does the US come out of your narrative on the, the longevity imperative? Not terribly well. I mean, and of course, Angus is Scottish. I'm not sure I like you calling him English, but uh, but he, he really focuses on part of yeah. a really big problem. Uh, so here's a couple of issues. First of all, America does have high life expectancy. I mean, um, you know, it's increased. Uh, it's not increasing as fast as other countries. It's starting to falter. Uh, and a lot of that is about inequality. And what Angus focuses on in particular is those deaths in midlife. And what is striking is for a few years, American life expectancy slightly dipped, not by a lot, but it slightly dipped. And that was all life expectancy at birth, not life expectancy at 65, that carried on rising. And those deaths of despair, which are very heavily concentrated uh, amongst uh, you know, white, non-Hispanic, non-college educated people, are so great, they brought down the average life expectancy in the US. But the US is, a, you know, like my country now as well, a country of great inequality. And so if you're in the top end of the income distribution, your life expectancy is still carried on increasing. At the bottom end, it's been stalling. And I think that's a great problem. Both the UK and the US, we're now falling further and further behind the countries with the highest life. And I don't suppose the best place to age is, uh, is Denmark. It always seems to be a leader. We joke about it on this show. Everyone wants to be like Denmark, but I, I'm guessing that the Danes age best, do they, Andrew? I mean, they do age well. I mean, it's not, Japan actually has the highest life expectancy. Is that because of the food, though? I just saw a piece about how well the, the Japanese eat, particularly female Japanese. I think there's something in that. What Japan seems to be particularly good at is dealing with inequality and making sure that uh, health and lifespan is sort of spread more equally across the population. So I think that does quite a lot to propel the average. They also sort of do stuff like uh, you know, older people in general tend to be better integrated in society, so they have more purposeful uh, life. In Japan, I thought also Japan was um, afflicted with loneliness, and that's where... They do. Uh, mm -hmm. Robots are very popular to look after old people. Yeah, there's a lot of different things happening here. And I'm very keen to draw a distinction with what I call an aging society, which is there being more old people relative to young, so a change in the age structure. And then what I call the longevity imperative, which is changing how we age. And, and Japan and China, they've got a really dramatic change in the age structure. They went 
very quickly through a high growth period. Their birth rate fell very sharply. They don't have much immigration. So they've got very few young people and lots of old people, which is leading to those loneliness problems that you're referring to. Whereas America, uh, the birth rate has fallen, uh, but not as quickly and not as much as in Japan. There's much higher levels of aggregation of uh, immigration. And so there is an aging society in the US. There are a rising number of people aged over 65, but nowhere near as dramatic as what you're seeing in Japan and China. You talk about aging being malleable, Andrew. Um, is it as malleable for the working class as it is for the middle or upper middle class? Well, yes, it's simply, I mean, in, in a way that inequality proves how malleable aging is. If 80% of how we age is down to behavior in the environment, we can speed up aging by giving people bad environments and making their behavior not support uh, a healthy life. So I would argue, that, of course, I mean, it, genetic, you know, that this is available to everyone. It's simply that we don't have a society that produces those outcomes right now. But that inequality is the very proof of how malleable it is. There's also a lot of progress being made at the moment in the science of aging. It's still early stages, but undoubtedly science is also discovering at a really genetic level that aging may be much more malleable than we thought. Whether that's going to lead to uh, anytime soon to significant treatments is another matter. But yeah, for sure, aging is malleable. And we know that. You know, we know, if we tell people you look good for your age, we know that biological age is not the same as chronological age. And my key point in the book is that if you're now likely in your 40s to get it through to be 80 or 90, you need to focus on exploiting that malleability of age more than any previous generation. It's rather like saving. So you're suggesting that instead of putting your money into a retirement fund, you invest in yourself to get old. Absolutely. Because you know, you know, what we've managed to achieve is long life. So in America, the lifestyle is as long as elsewhere, but they're still long. You know, globally, life expectancy now exceeds 70. In America, it's over 80 if you allow for future changes, improvements. So the young and middle age can expect to become old. So we have these long lives. What we don't have is a health system or a lifestyle or social norms to help us age healthily. So we need to make sure health span catches up with lifespan. We also don't have great support to help us be productive and engaged for longer. And some of that is about working for longer. Uh, but it's also about just sort of being engaged and purposeful in society. Yeah, I think some of this stuff goes without saying. What about the dark side of this, Andrew, on the gerontocratic? In my introduction, I talked about the political yeah. gerontocracy in America. Clearly, for one reason or other, young people are not manifesting their power in politics. There are there aren't any Bobby Kennedys or yeah. Uh, John Kennedy's anymore. They all seem to be Joe Biden or Donald Trump, uh, increasingly yeah. old and irrelevant. And the other thing that strikes me about the US and perhaps the UK as well is this enormous concentration of wealth in our, your and my generation, the boomer generation, particularly in real estate, which is not, to, to borrow a, a term from Reagan, trickling down to anyone else. So there are, just as there are more and more old people in our society they're wealthier and wealthier is is there some truth to that oh no definitely i mean I, you know my, my my main point is when for the first time ever in human history the young and middle-aged and expect to become the very old we have a lot of changes to do and you know we can seize advantages but we've got to be careful of avoiding problems so let's tackle the gerontocracy one first of all i, I you know all this i'm not a great fan of these generational labels like gen z etc uh, but they're always defining people differently by technology. But one of the things that makes the young today different is they expect their parents and grandparents to hang around for a lot longer. They expect them to hang around a lot longer in the workplace, blocking work promotion. They can expect them to hang around a lot longer, delaying when they get money. So there's a whole bunch of issues here that make intergenerational issues much more complicated than before. When it comes to gerontocracy, there's a couple of issues we've got to try and distinguish. One of which is just ageism. There's a lot of negative things said about older people. I often hear, for instance, it's said that older people's votes should count for less than younger people, which, you know, if you said that about any other demographic group, you would rightly be accused of being undemocratic. You know, when the US first set up its constitution, there was an idea that only people with property should be allowed to vote because otherwise the property would be stolen from them from taxation, etc. So lots of negative things about older people. We assume that older people are not capable, they don't have skills. And, you know, whilst there definitely are issues with having older politicians, there's a lot of just 
things that are said that are wrong and undemocratic. Um, but I think there's another issue, which is that we do have to make sure that our voting and institutions reflect the interests of everyone, that everyone has a voice. That's the key thing for me about democracy. And what's there, I think, very interesting is America has got these very old presidential candidates. In Europe, our leaders are getting younger and younger. Our prime ministers are getting younger every year rather than older. So there might be something we need to change about our institutions. And in the States, perhaps there's a, you know, not just a term limit about being president, but a term limit how long you can be involved in elected politics. Perhaps it's something to do with fundraising and you know, perhaps restrictions there might help. Or if we change voting to make it easier to vote digitally, that might get younger people involved. So I, I rather than sort of say, oh, wow, this is a battle between young and old, I think we need to think about how we adapt our institutions to make sure everyone has a voice. And somehow that seems to be happening in other countries, but less so in the United States. I wonder if, uh, Andrew, one way or the other, cultural, political, generational warfare is unavoidable and, and not even necessarily a bad thing. Classes, generations struggling for power. You say that um, young people write off old people, but uh, my sense in the US is the reverse is true. Old people are writing off young people. There's more and more uh, I use this word carefully, cultural discrimination against young people, especially in the, the coastal elites, that the young people don't work hard enough, that they're, they're, they're snowflake generation, uh, that they're too sensitive, that they're too anxious. As a, a student of all these generational changes, what do you make of this? Is there some truth to it? Or is it old people fighting back, trying to underline their virtue and, and indeed longevity? So, I mean, great questions. Let me unpack again lots of things. And, I, and by the way, I didn't go back on the wealth issue, which I need to talk about. So, um, I, one of my worries is with an aging society, we always focus on the needs of older people. With a longevity society, you've got to focus on the young because they've got the longest lives. You know, I would say an aging society begins when you've got lots of people aged over 65. A longevity society begins when you have lots of people who live to be over 65. And we've really got to help the young deal with the longer lives that they face. How do they remain productive for longer? Because they will be working for longer given retirement age is increasing. How do they finance that? How do they get on the housing ladder? And one of the things that's happening is we're living longer is we're changing the life cycle. You know, I refer to my father, he started work at 14. He was literally never a teenager. I think the word teenager is first used in the New Yorker article in 1937. He was 12, but I'm pretty sure he wasn't reading the New Yorker at that point. He went to work at 14, he's married at, he's in a war at 17, he's married at 18, he's got a kid at 19 and a house at 20. So we're seeing the life cycle change. And in some level, that of course means that the young start work later, they uh, um, uh, start with more debt, they have children later, they get a house later, so they're less wealthy. And if all that's happening is we're just shifting the life course so that when you're old, you have more and when you have young, you've got less, that's okay if everyone goes through that life cycle. It's more of a problem if the older people are blocking the opportunities of the young. And, I, and I'm sympathetic to that because I don't think we're understanding what's happening to the younger generation. They are struggling at work. And I think we've got to really make efforts to, it's not that the older people working for longer makes the younger people unemployed, but it does create, change the career path. It does mean that some occupations are close to them. I mean, the UK is the obvious example where King Charles, I think, is 73 when it finally takes over from the Queen. So I think there are really big issues here that we have to try and tackle with. However, I think it's a mistake to look at it through these generational labels. For most of human history, we haven't had these generational labels of boomers and Gen Z. We just had young and old. And there's always been tensions between young and old. Young people think old people are uh, dumb. Dumb people think old people think young people are dumb. And there's always that sort of conflict. There's always been that sort of challenge between them. What's sort of weird now is that because the young can now expect to become old, ageism is like a prejudice against your future self. For most of human history, the young couldn't expect to get old, so I kind of get the tension. Now it's a little bit counterproductive. So we've really got to try and tackle that, that ageism. We've got to focus on intergenerational stuff. But these Gen Z labels and boomer labels, they're zero sum because Gen Z will never become boomer. If you look at the individual data, you find in general the young and the old have some considerable respect for one another within the family, it generally tends to work. 
but I think we make too much of a noise at a generational level. It rarely feeds through in a way that, say, a class struggle does. We are speaking to Mr. Long Life himself, Andrew J. Scott, the author of a new book, The Longevity Imperative. I'm going to take a short break, Andrew. I want to remind everyone that high quality guests, wise men like Andrew J. Scott, are brought to us through the generosity of my friends at Liberty, a quarterly journal of culture and politics, wonderful new publication. I'm going to run a short feature about liberties. And then we'll be back with Andrew J. Scott to explore a little bit more concretely how we age or perhaps how we get younger in a world where we live perhaps to 100. So don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second. News, the noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens, politics, opinion, substance liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought a quarterly of urgency of cultural exploration of intellectual delight of immaculate prose it's invaluable subscribe now or find liberties at your favorite bookseller and you can subscribe to liberties at libertiesjournal.com it's a nice meaty publication it will allow you to get old uh, in a wise way uh, rather than watching television or going on to YouTube or uh, or Facebook. Um, we are talking with Andrew J. Scott, the author of The Longevity Imperative, Building a Better Society for Healthier, Longer Lives. Let's talk specifically, Andrew, about the book. Um, how do we build a better society? What does the society look like uh, when the majority of people are, quote, unquote, old? Yeah, so, I mean, the first thing is we've got to have a shift. We, we can't underestimate the capacity of older people. We can't underestimate the capacity of our later years because then we have a problem. And we do that. And it's interesting. It's been a very interesting social reversal about how we feel about older people. So the book talks about one study that has a meta-analysis of looking at American newspapers, books, magazines. And over 200 years, it's been a very interesting shift. 200 years ago, when you saw older people mentioned in the publication, it was with respect to uh, family, civic duty, responsibility, wisdom. Now it's all about um, uh, dementia and uh, adult diapers. So it's been a really interesting shift. I think part of that is because we've medicalized old age. We see old age purely in terms of health and medicine and say, therefore, it's only about decline. We ignore the things that then increase with age. And, you know, not just talking about my waistline, there are other things that increase with age. You look at people who are 70 and 80, they tend to be happier than people in their 40s and 50s. Generally, there seems to be an, an idea, I don't want to call it wisdom, because not every old person is wise, but something about sort of self-knowledge and uh, uh, an understanding comes of being older, which is good. We also have, uh, you know, we have a thing in economics called the old age dependency ratio. This is everyone aged over 65 is dependent, needs a pension, doesn't work, and is a burden. First of all, you know, if you're listening to this and you're 30, that's going to be you in 35 years time. So have a little think about what that might mean. But lots of people aged over 65 are not dependent. Lots of people under 65 are. Lots of people aged over 65 have all sorts of roles in the family, caring for children, grandchildren, caring for spouses, or in, are more likely to be actively involved in society. So we've got to change this notion that um, older people uh, are a burden. Um, we've also got to change the notion that our later years are, are inevitably one of decline because it doesn't have to be. If we take action now, we can age better. And for a social society, I think there's a cultural change, but then there's more concrete changes. And you know, our signal kind of two, I think, are really important right now. One is around our health system, because we don't have a health system, particularly in my country. We have a, a system that focuses upon disease. Right now, we have a health system that says, when your disease manifests itself in a way that is actually impairing, come along and we'll try and treat it. That works well if you have an infectious disease. It's a nightmare for aging related to disease. Yeah, I mean, in the US, as I'm sure you know, the, the system is uh, worse even than the UK, which is quite an achievement. Yeah, and, and of course, you know, we're spending ever more money in the US. Huge and amounts. certainly the, uh, the US is, and we've done many shows on the dysfunctionality of the US system. Yeah. Well, and there's well, there's US dysfunctionality, but but you know what? There's a lovely quote by W. H. Auden in the book, which roughly says, "Health is a thing that your medicine knows nothing about." 
Uh, and I said this to a doctor the other day, is that healthy is just an incomplete diagnosis. You know, something might happen to make you unhealthy. So we've really got to start focusing on keeping us healthy. And that's key with these aging related diseases, because once you get one of them, say cardiovascular problem, then pretty soon you're going to get diabetes and then dementia because they're all yeah, kind of Andrew, uh, we've done so many shows on this. We've all read hundreds of books and newspaper articles and magazine pieces on healthier living. Uh, exercise. I mean, there seems to be two, th well, three or four things. Uh, eat m more responsibly. Yeah. Don't drink as much. Don't smoke. Don't take illegal drugs and uh, lose a bit of weight and exercise it doesn't take uh, a professor at london business school or harvard medical school to tell us this everybody if they made even the slightest effort could understand that why do so many people still ignore that all right so i'll give you a and by the way i'm so glad you say that because you know i, I think there's a couple of things that have happened the first is we're doing a bit of a scientific upgrade on that, but you're right, the things are just blindingly obvious. It's eat better, drink less, sleep more, and have- I forgot sleep, and have, have better relationships, and don't lock yourself in a room. And you know, and everyone loves the sort of the extreme people who do this weird and wacky stuff, but I, I don't know, I can't, I haven't got the willpower to do the weird and wacky stuff. So what has changed, and I think this is what's really difficult, so you, you know, behavioral change is very, very hard to do. But what's changed is not, what we need to do but our incentive to do it and i think i go back to the fact that most people you know were brought up assuming that at 58 i don't have to think about what i'm going to be at 90 because my dad didn't my grandparents didn't but i do so the incentive to do it has changed and raising awareness about that is key but i agree behavioral change is really really hard which is why we also need a system change and there's loads of things we can do in the health system, particularly now with uh, big data, genetic testing, AI, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we can catch diseases early. So, you know, if you can catch that, can't most cancers in stage one, it's really very high chance of being cured. Get it stage three, stage four, you've got a problem. So there's a change in social norms because right now in our health system, the patient is pretty underutilized. We present ourselves when we're ill, but we're just going to have to do more monitoring and some of that is just about social norms copying and you know making use of what's around but definitely the health system uh, has to change it's not just about behavior but then we can also expect and i think this is where the anti-obesity drugs are very interesting treatments come along that will help us to age better and i wish it was about behavioral change i wish everyone started to go hiking in the mountains and uh, 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 better but I suspect we're going to see it's going to come through a lot of uh, um, therapeutics. And the anti-obesity drugs are really interesting at the moment because they kind of look a bit like an anti-aging thing. They don't just make you lose weight as well as giving you a bit of agency. They kind of affect They're expensive and they're making every time you take one of those pills, you make the Danes richer. Is, is there a danger, Andrew, yeah. though, of, uh, of us? with all this longevity of transforming ourselves into a brave new world. Huxley wrote about this in the 1930s, and in some ways, yeah. his dystopia is much more accurate than the ones that Orwell imagined in the 30s. Oh, totally. No, we're, we're, we're all addicted to short-term happiness stuff. Um, no, I think it's a really good question. And one of the things that worries me is, you know, so I'm kind of so keen about the longevity of and the way it finishes the, the last chapter, it's all about what it is us as humans because you know for all the negativity about living longer and it, and it is remarkable how negative we are about this aging society story which as i say is warning fewer children warning fewer parents snatched away in midlife more grandparents meeting grandchildren we turn around and go oh shit, we've got an aging society which is a remarkably negative way of seeing this great thing longevity is really about more time if you can be healthy and productive for longer, and we can, I don't know how far we can take it, but we can certainly do better than we currently are. It opens up, and as an economist, I kind of find myself surprised as saying this, you can develop as an adult for longer. That's, so I used to hear the psychologists say this a lot and didn't get it. It opens up the scope for adult development. And when life is short, we think adult development ends when you're 12, when you go from being a child to an adult. Life expectancy extends, we introduce teenagers, we then introduced pensions and midlife in the 20th century. We met a midlife crisis. But if you're living for longer, you can develop more as an adult. And it's that very human thing that matters. And of course, you know, what's the most important thing about us as humans? It's our sense of connectivity. 
I think that's that's the really important thing with a longer life. It's got to be your life. What do you want to do with it? There's no point just fasting and being miserable, but you've got to enjoy it. But it opens up the opportunity to see your children for longer, to meet your grandchildren, make new friends. And that has to be that human side of this aging society. Whereas right now, I think we tend to dehumanize older people and, and just reduce them to dementia and adult diapers, which, you know, when we talk about AI and climate change, we talk about adaptation and adjustment at a big scale. When it comes to an aging society, as I say, it's all about how do we cope with care homes and adult diapers. We can surely do better than that. Speaking of AI, Andrew, what do you make of the, the, the long, long, long life fanatics on the West Coast, particularly in Silicon Valley, who believe, some of them at least, that we might even be able to live forever. Ray Kurzweil, of course, is associated with that, a man who seems to spend most of his life taking pills. Uh, are, are some of these Californians insane, to put it politely? Uh, I have to say, if I were to look at the most pressing issue that I'm dealing with right now, it's not sort of how I cope with living forever. Uh, I, I feel there's more immediate things to worry about. So in the book, I try and do some economic calculations. The most valuable health challenge to society and us as individuals, and it is worth trillions of dollars, and I've done the economic calculations to show it, is to make sure that health span matches lifespan. So, you know, rather than think about how we live to 150, we've got to think, how do we get the majority of us to make sure that if we're living to 87, which is the UK life expectancy, it's a healthy 87. So it's just making sure health span is better. And I think, you know, that is far and away the most important thing. Can we get the sort of geroscience equivalents of a statin, a cheap pill we could take every day that helps us live another year of our life in a healthy way? That's amazing. By the way, it's currently called exercise, but you know that, that that's the sort of stuff that we're talking about. However, you know, I, I say there's there's a first longevity revolution is finished. The majority can now expect to become old. That's an amazing thing. Global life expectancy is now over seventy. So now a second longevity revolution begins, which is changing how we age, and that's interesting because I, you know, if we're ill in our 90s, no one wants to be 90. We don't want to be drooling in dementia and care homes. But if we can be healthy and we're 90, well, bring on 100. And if we can be healthy when we're 100, bring on 110. And I've no idea how far we'll get in this process. There's a battle between human ingenuity and human biology. But that's what the second longevity brings in. We are going to focus, just as we used to focus on infant diseases and cardiac diseases on aging. And the more progress we make at aging better, the more interested we are in aging even more. But aging is a complicated thing. It's not just some simple system where you take an injection, you're going to age well. So I, I don't think we're any, anywhere near on the verge of living forever. Uh, but I do think we are on the verge of possibly thinking about introducing some drugs that might make us age better so that we are healthy for longer. But that starts this radical new moment in human history so who knows where we'll be in two three hundred years time but i very much doubt that i'll be alone you're a, an unusually sunny economist uh andrew unusually optimistic and cheerful there's another reading of this isn't there that as more and more of us live longer and longer it has a, a worse and worse impact on on the planet we take more and more resources you present us as having fulfilling lives and going back to school and having lives of meaning and looking after ourselves and all that sort of thing, which goes obviously goes without saying. You can't argue with that. But as more and more of us live on this planet and the planet itself is endangered, um, is there an argument for, if not forced euthanasia, certainly uh, encouraging death? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Huxleyan trope, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, nothing I've said that says that we should try and uh, live forever. And I think mortality is a. But just very, but, very but to come back, you you mentioned Prince Charles. I think he's made this argument, didn't necessarily make him very popular, that there's simply too many people in the world. Yeah, no, so, so let's take that on. So I don't know how you feel about cancer research or, or research, cardiovascular research. I mean, all of those have the effect of having people live for longer. Uh, they're not necessarily in better health. But I don't hear people say, oh, we should just cancel all of that. So I think, you know, if we look at the data, what we got is I'm not saying longevity is the only issue to focus on. We clearly have to focus on the environment. I think 
you know, right now we have an unsustainable way of living. And whether the world population is you know, 8 billion or 10 billion or 6 billion, that's a problem if we're unsustainable. We have to shift to a sustainable lifestyle. So when we have a sustainable lifestyle, I think we can support a large population. So we urgently need to focus on sustainability. And actually, you know, if we have a better environment, we're going to be healthier for longer. So the two absolutely run together. Right now, we've got life expectancy in rich countries heading towards 90. That doesn't have a huge impact on the population. What really matters to the population is the birth rate. Mm. So if you have and I was going to ask you about the birth rate and the, the new generation, which doesn't seem very keen on having babies. No. So the population in many countries is falling, uh, we're having fewer kids, and it's the fertility rate that really drives it. Now, if overnight we suddenly take life expectancy from 90 to 500, then that doesn't have an immediate effect on the population, but it, as you can imagine, in, in 10 years' time, 20 years' time, 30 years' time, it has a big effect. But I don't think we're talking about those sort of radical breakthroughs. So going from life expectancy going from 90 to 95 is going to have a pretty small effect on the world population. Uh, it's the fertility rate that, that matters. So I don't particularly worry about that. Radical life extension has radical implications for the population, but I don't think that's anywhere near on the horizon. We're just talking about making sure we age better. And that is a huge welfare issue, as of course is making sure the environment is better. But, you know, the biggest lifetime challenge that your listeners will, will uh, we experience in terms of health is how they age. And just as the climate's important for our future, I can think of nothing more important for your future than how you age, Andrew, and me as well. So I'm just saying this is really big and we ignore it, but it's really, really important and we just don't have any focus on it. And maybe we're not all becoming Denmark or China or the UK or the US. Is the, is, is, is the future Italy, Andrew? There seems to be a society that is aggressively aging perhaps is the best way of putting it yeah again i think it's really important to distinguish two things you know, the sort of how quickly the demographic transition is happening and it's pretty quick and it has a sprawling population in america where the population is still rising um i wouldn't say if he does a particular i mean there's some uh the, the blue zones some of them are in italy uh so there's this, this notion that the blue zones show how we should all be living later I, I, I think Italy's got a problem with its fertility rate. It's having very few children. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really interesting with all this debate is we're seeing people wanting to have fewer children, if that's the main reason. Um, uh, the children becoming more and more expensive and people want to focus more and more, I think, on their own life. Uh, and so, and we're having more and more people living for longer. And governments around the world say, oh my goodness, I've got to get you to change your behavior so my social security system survives. That's a bizarre way of looking at things. I think we've got to accept people want fewer children, people are living for longer. How do we adjust our institutions to support what people want? And that's not what we're doing at the moment. We're simply saying, oh, let's increase social security age because that solves the financing problem. And that does nothing to help people work for longer. It does nothing to keep them healthier for longer. We're trying to provide incentives, tax incentives, for people to have more kids. But why? If people don't want to have more kids. Why would you give them tax incentives to have more kids? You're very reasonable, Andrew. Let's end on an unreasonable question. Um, do we really want to build a better society for healthier, longer lives for everyone? I mean, surely you and I would, we're okay with building a better society for healthier, longer lives for Spurs fans. But what about for the Arsenal? Surely we want them to die as quickly as possible. Yeah, well, that's about you know, whether life's a good life or a bad or a bad. Well, we're supposed to suffer to forever. We're both Spurs fans and wait for hundreds of years to maybe come forth again. Well, I've never seen Spurs win the league in my lifetime, so perhaps that's why I keep writing about a hundred-year life. I, but perhaps it 